Hi everyone, welcome back to the Docs and DX track of API Days Paris. Let's continue with today's second topic, what you need to keep in mind when you create a modern or next generation developer portal. Our next speaker will be Christoph Van Tom, who is the CEO and the co-founder of Pronovix, a company that is uh, building developer portals in Drupal. Today, he is going to explain how API documentation and your developer portal can help you to turn your organization into a complex adaptive system. Hi, welcome. How's the sound? Is good? Yeah. You had a good lunch? Yeah, good. So, um, this is a weird talk. <laughs> um, because uh, it's born from my background in biotechnology and my interest in ecosystems and systems thinking. And uh, my current job as the um, CEO of a developer portal company that specializes in do doing documentation for APIs. And uh, for the last couple of years, I've been trying to marry these two perspectives. Well, actually, forever, basically, because, you know. <laughs> um, but um, a couple of years ago, I, I bumped into this book that um, I spent a whole summer chewing over, trying to understand it, really understand it, but it didn't really work because it was really complex. And then found this book that better explained it from a friend of the previous author that completely changed my perspective on a lot of things. Um, and uh, for the last, I think, three, four years, I've been looking for a race to translate that perspective into something that is useful for um, people doing APIs and, and people doing digital transformation. And that's this talk. <laughs> now, in the meantime, I've read a whole bunch of books. If you ask my colleagues, I'm always coming back with, a, you know, Christoph read a book is kind of a, a, a very common thing at our company. So I read some of these books. And then um, last week I read this book and then I had to go and redo my slides because I, I, it, it opened a new perspective. So this is, um, um, presentations always are performance art, but this is definitely performance art. I'd love to hear your comments. I'd love to hear what it's inspired, how it inspired you, what it made you think. Um, it's going to be more philosophical and strategic than very, very, you know, actionable tac tactical things. Um, but I think it should definitely give you a new perspective on, on how all of this works. So I, what I want to start with is this quote from um, The Six Simple Rules, the, the last book that I showed. Um, I'm not going to read it up because reading up is, for, is not for me. Um, but uh, what it says is that, um, and this is really profound, it, it looks kind of stupid, but it's super profound, is that um, when you create rules in an organization, when you create procedures, that doesn't mean that people will actually follow those. People will use those rules and those procedures as their environment in, in, inside of which they will do the things that they're doing. So whatever re rule you set up, like don't ever expect that people will actually follow it. You always have to look for the unintended consequences. And this is the heart of those two first two books that I mentioned, at least for me, um, and also for the rest of the presentation. Okay. So, but my goals for the session are to m make you interested in systems thinking. Who's heard of systems thinking before? Some people. Yes. <laughs> so, good. Um, uh, complex adaptive systems. Who's heard of that? Yeah, you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they work with me, so, <laughs> so they, they hear a lot of this. Um, and the role of APIs and developer portals in the first two. But first, I want to start with what is digital transformation? Because um, it's kind of a buzzword, and it's, it's becoming a little bit hollowed out because you know, everything becomes digital transformation, and it's kind of like, you know, here comes another person telling me what digital transformation is. But I wanted to go back to basics to redefine it from a systems perspective, and, um, and why I think it is important, uh, which is a lot more than just being competitive. Um, I think the core of digital transformation is that today our companies are like trees. They, they're, very, they're pretty adaptive when they grow up, but then once they've grown, 
uh, they become kind of um, rigid. They're, they're not that adaptive anymore. You can still cut off branches and new stuff will grow, but it, it's, um, it's, it's a lot more fixed. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're taking our trees and we're trying to turn them into ant heaps. And that's a really hard thing to do. <laughs> but I think this is digital transformation for me. To make it a little bit more concrete, I think what we're trying to do is take something like an oil tanker, which is like the enterprise that's very hierarchical, where all the decisions are taken at the top and it takes like a year to change course. You know, it takes a year to buy something. You know, you recognize that, people from enterprise companies. Um, to turn them into something that's much more adaptive, that has much more surface with the world, where it can learn and adapt. Similarly, um, it's taking silos, um, value silos, value flows, and turning them into value networks, where different components are interacting with each other in a non-designed way. So it's, it's more bottom-up and it's more evolutionary. And I think that all of these movements are digital transformation. All of these movements are about the same thing. Um, it's just really hard to grasp it because it's such a, yeah, it's a lot of different things in the same time. Uh, so inner sourcing, uh, agile transformations, DevOps, um, APIs, APIs also. But what, now, to understand it a little bit better, I'd like to take even one step further and look at what triggered this uh, need for change. And I think the big need that triggered it is this change of the environment. And like, yes, digital changed everything, and uh, you know we have to adjust. But it's much more fundamental what happens, because it's not just that we're able to communicate. This is changing the architecture of the world. It's changing the architecture of how business works. It's changing everything. And not just because we can faster communicate. It has much deeper implications. Because digital technology increases interconnectedness and interdependence. And that results in two major shifts. First one is uh, the value space singularity, as I coined it, um, <laughs> is that from proximity, being close to, to your salesperson, being close to somebody uh, as the main dimension of value, we've moved towards um, experience and flow um, convenience, familiarity, immediacy as the main sources of value. Like, it's no longer that important how close you live to your, your customer. It's much more important how fast you can service them and how easy that is and what the experience is going to be like. And that's a massive, massive shift. It's kind of like a, either it's like a wormhole for value space or like a big bang and a big, you know, anyway. Um, I'm also a space geek. Uh, so, um, but the other thing that this did, and this is the even, more, even bigger impact, I believe, is that it's increased the complexity of the world around us, of our environment. Because interdependence and, and interconnection are two variables from uh, the four variables that drive complex behavior. So uh, I, I, there's a lot more... This is like a, a course in complexity that I'm trying to condense into 20 minutes. So um, if you want to learn more about this, uh, Understanding Complexity from Scotty Page um, is a really good audiobook. It's like a course. You can get it on Audible. Um, he talks about a bunch of different things. But one, one of them is these four variables that if you're somewhere in the middle, so not completely interdependent, not completely not interdependent, uh, on all of these four, then you get complex behavior. You get this magical emergent thing that, um, that makes things so robust in, in ecosystems and in nature. Very, very short, what it means practically for you, if you're, especially if, like who works in a large enterprise company. Okay? So <laughs> the way we used to build companies is like the watch. We used to build companies as machines where we would take people, we tell them exactly what to do, what their job is, and uh, they would be part of a, a very, very defined flow of value that was very efficient as long as the environment didn't change. Because machines and complicated systems, um, uh, systems that can be understood by experts, they're really, really good at doing what they're supposed to do as long as you don't change where they are. 
If, they if you change the environment, the whole thing explodes. Complex systems, on the other hand, like ecosystems, like, um, like us, like um, uh, communities, they're much more resilient. And they're, um, but they're, they're impossible to understand because there's emergent behavior that you can't predict by looking at the individuals. There's, there's surprising stuff all the time. Um, but they're also a lot more resilient because if you change the environment, a complex system can adjust. You can like, take, like, you can kill a tenth of those birds and they'll still be showing the same behavior. Um, and and it's, that's kind of weird and, and, and very interesting. This has implications on everything, right? This has implications on global warming, on, on uh, our society, on politics, on, on everything. Um, but it also has a lot of impact on our businesses, and that's what I'm going to focus on. <laughs> uh, I'll stay away from politics. It's too sad. <laughs> um, because uh, I don't know if you've heard of the Cinefin framework. This is a framework for thinking about problems. Um, and uh, you can't try to solve every problem the same way. Um, so there's uh, simple problems that are very easy to solve because there's one peak, you just keep going up and you get to the top. You have complicated problems that are like a hilly landscape, like a rugged landscape. You go to the peak and you notice like, oh, there's a bigger peak there. And you go down, you go back up, it's like, oh, there's another peak there. And you, you know, you, it's hard to find your maximum. Um, and, uh, but an expert knows where the peaks are and can get you there. Complex problems are like, um, like uh, um, yeah, it, it, they're like a sea. Like, well, it's not like a sea, but every time somebody makes a decision, the whole landscape changes. It's a dancing landscape. So like when low-cost airlines entered the market, suddenly everything changed and everybody had to adjust. And, and every time anybody makes a, a change in the way they're doing things, everything changes again. And to be able to keep up with all these changes, you need, you need to be different. You can't be a complicated system because you fail. You can't, you can't keep up. So because complex environments require complex agents, um, uh, because complex agents are able to match out, outside complexity with internal complexity and adjust like on the fly, just changing their behavior on the fly. And complex, um, um, complex systems like beehives, they, they show this complex adaptive emergent behavior. Uh, as I said earlier, it's showing behavior that you wouldn't expect if you look at a single bee in, in isolation. And my hypothesis, and here we come to the developer portals and the APIs, <laughs> is that a developer portal can help you with um, fostering complex adaptive behavior. Uh, can be kind of a, a central uh, resource that allows you to manage complexity, uh, to tune for complexity, because you want complexity, because it will help you to adjust to the world outside of you. First, short words. So I'm Christoph from Pronovix. We're a consultancy that specializes in developer portals. Um, as far as we know, we're the only consultancy in the world that's fully dedicated to developer portals. There's a bunch of agencies that will build you a dev portal. There's a bunch of API companies that will make you a dev portal. But as far as we know, there's nobody specialized in customizing dev portals. There's products, but that, that part, as far as we know, we, there's nobody else so far. Um, we, we did a bunch of dev portals in the past couple of years. We also worked with Apigee as part of Google on their dev portal, uh, on, on the um, Drupal modules for Apigee. Um, we've won awards with our dev portals. We've organized awards for dev portals. Um, we organized a conference, uh, API the Docs, that's, um, that's our brainchild. Um, this track is part of the API the Docs community. Um, so, you know, like we, we share our knowledge in a bunch of different places and, you know, so, patterns for complex, adaptive, complex adaptivity. What I'm, well, so I'm, I'm still digesting this, right? Because it's very complex <laughs> to, you know, very meta. But um, um, I think there's these five uh, properties that I, I've, I've, I've um, analyzed a little bit further and did a little bit of thinking about, and this is what I'm going to share. We'd love to hear your feedback. I'd love to hear if you have uh, concrete examples of some of this stuff. Some of these, I have concrete examples myself from talking with customers, but it's still, you know, I'm still exploring it. I'm still learning. Um, it's, a, 
yeah, it's a lot of work um, because it's it's a complex area. <laughs> um, so the first one, so and what I've tried to do is to create five objectives that you can have as an organization to become a complex adaptive system. Okay. First one is remove developer friction through improved developer experience. Why does this matter? Um, as I said earlier, we, we're living through this, the time of the value singularity, right? where proximity is gone and it's now all about experience and flow. One of the best ways to improve flow is to have APIs that allow developers to automate um, interactions and to speed up interactions. So you can remove a lot of friction from your customer interactions with your business. One of the best ways to make that possible is by creating APIs with a good developer experience <laughs> so that that friction can be removed um, um, even more efficiently instead of having to explain every time to every single um, developer how you're going to use your APIs. Practically, how you do that, and um, Arnaud Lorette talks, talks about some of this also, um, is the, the key is that you can't do top-down developer experience. You can't say, every API needs to have blah, blah, blah. Like, you can do that, but it's not enough. Um, also, when you, when you uh, enforce it too much, um, you're not necessarily going to get a good experience. It requires cooperation. Um, it requires interaction between API consumers and API producers. And this is really important. Um, most people I've talked with never do this. I've talked with some, some, even at one enterprise company I know, that actually um, that have have told me that they started doing this, talking with the developers that use their APIs to help improve the the design of the API so that the experience will be better. Second is um, you can't expect um, developer experience to be good without somebody to have to pay adjustment costs. What is important here is that what I've seen, so one is the very top down, the other one is the kumbaya, everything is awesome. Like we're, we're just gonna let developers do whatever they want and it's gonna be awesome. That doesn't work. You have to go into conflict to be able to get to a good experience. Cooperation requires conflict. It doesn't mean that it requires coercion and aggression but it does require conflict. Conflict and aggression are not the same thing. It's really important. If you want to learn more about this, uh, there's a really good book about um, nonviolent communication. Um, it's super, super important. Um, okay. Second, increasing interconnection through APIs. Um, you remember one of the, the four parameters was interconnection. So practically, Oh, this is one of the first questions people ask us. How many dev portals do I need? <laughs> I'm like, okay. Um, uh, most of the time, this is because they, they don't know if they need to have one dev portal, both for internal and external use cases, or how to do that. I think there is a, there's a definitely um, use in doing a dev portal for external uh, use cases separately, uh, because you need a different experience, so it makes sense. But please, don't let all your developer teams make their own dev portal, right? Because if you have a zoo of dev portals, nobody's going to use another team's dev portal. If, if every, different, every department has their own dev portal, they're not going, there's not going to be interoperation, uh, interconnection. Um, second, um, encourage reuse, but don't mandate it. I'm still on the fence about this one. Because um, sometimes, I think complex systems need to grow. This is one of the things that keeps coming back, that you have to let complex systems grow. But um, I, I, I think there's a way to provide a scaffold to facilitate the growth. Um, but um, I think what you need to be careful with is that you don't say, OK, everybody, we're going to do APIs now. Here's the way we're going to do APIs. Like, we're going to have authentication API, we're going to have this API, that API, that API. And everybody from now on has to use that. I think that um, um, it will not necessarily result in better interconnection, but I'm not sure. Um, this is something that I, I, I'd like to hear feedback about and, and, and talk more about. Third, use APIs to engage with more diversity. What I mean with this, and this is actually really interesting, is that 
Uh, first of all, if you use internal APIs, most enterprise companies already have a lot of diversity. Now, I'm not talking about gender diversity or racial diversity, which is front and center today. I'm talking about um, diversity from a cultural perspective. Most enterprises are in a bunch of different places and already naturally have quite a lot of diversity from that perspective. Um, I'm not saying that the other two are also not really important. They are. Um, but I'm now talking about that part of diversity. And um, so what you can do through an API program is to bring into contact different parts of your organizations where there's different diversity in touch with other parts of your organization. Second, on the outside, um, an, an API, like a, a, an API partner platform, like a platform a play, a platform business model, can, will allow you to get into touch with diversity from outside of your organization and to maybe bring that inside or to just benefit from it while it's on the outside. Four, um, create loosely coupled interdependence through APIs. This is one of the most important ones. Because remember SOAP? <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> I, I, I fully understood this um, when I saw a presentation by Robin Meissner from TUI. He talked about um, the difference between REST APIs and SOAP APIs. And what he said was that in REST APIs, uh, they're, they're not giving you all the potential, like they prevent you from failing. They're designed in such a way that you can, you, you know, you can provide parameters to a REST API but you can't dictate everything. Like, you don't have to define everything. It's just, there's, it's um, uh, um, a reduced set so that you, you won't fail. And, and I thought that was brilliant. Um, so for that reason, I got three here. One is, ideally, APIs are constrained so that you can't fail. But, also really important, you have to be open enough so that you can be creative and you can have surprising applications. An API that doesn't surprise you is a bad API, right? And so if, if people don't do things that you never expected, then something's wrong. Then you've built a product, rather, like, yeah, like you've built um, um, an application rather than an API. Third, um, consumers should be able to influence API design and capabilities, but they shouldn't be able to dictate them. And this is a hard one, <laughs> because you have to uh, we, we are going through this exercise right now with our customers. Uh, so we're, we're um, productizing our dev portals. Uh, so we, we're doing enterprise dev portals. So we built whatever you need. But our customers are telling us, um, actually, we don't whatever we want. We want you to tell us when we're wrong asking for something. And, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, you want, and we want you to like, then sell it also to other people so that we're not the only ones maintaining it which is a really, really hard exercise. It's really exciting and interesting, but it's a very hard exercise. The last one, um, APIs are a boundary that allows teams to adapt inside of that boundary. Um, uh, so APIs allow for adaptability. Uh, again, because they're constrained in such a way that they're not fully open and not fully coupled, what's inside of the API boundary is able to evolve and adjust. And that's, that's really important because that's, that get, creates that adaptivity that we didn't have in the SOAP era. Um, what does that mean practically for dev portals and API design? Be careful with API versioning, um, but do allow for change. Don't say like, you know, we can only have one API version, it has to be forever the same. You, know, you have to, again, take it from both sides. And then uh, the, the second one is that you should probably be looking at integrating your documentation process into your development process doing docs code, doing synchronization of your documentation from your developers into your uh, production environment so that they're always up to date with the API so that your consumers can adapt to the change that's happening inside. So those, those are the five rules that I put together. How did I do? How did this work? Did it, like, we'd love to hear feedback. Um, it's, um, yeah, happy swarming, I would say. <laughs> Um, we have, I'll be writing about this on our newsletter, so if you're interested, uh, sign up. Uh, we got a lot of developer portal news and API documentation news on there. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of books, but I'll share my slides with all the 
uh, all the titles <laughs> um, where you can you can look at it uh, and and uh, and find out. So I want to. I have maybe one minute for questions, or I don't. Yeah, for questions. Yes. Oh, yeah. Thank okay. you, Christoph. Thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> so again, are there any questions? <laughs> Anybody wants to go for a beer or <laughs> <a> wine? <laughs> yeah. Anyone? Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'll keep keep tuned. Uh, there'll be more. It will be evolving. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Well, it was just easy. Can you share your list of books by? Uh, I'll share it on the Twitter. Okay. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you okay. again. You can Thanks. find Christoph later here, so you can ask any questions if you want. <laughs>